more than one of the Frontal servers is up in the new Hello. So uh, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to do a little brainstorm session. Um, so I threw some ideas by, by email, but feel free to bring more things. Um, so the idea that I wanted us to discuss a little bit about uh, and have your point of view on is how we generalize the principle of backprop. So backprop has been incredibly successful uh, in deep learning, but it relies on these uh, very smooth uh, operations. Uh, or it ignores gradients when you are in saturation regions, for example, of rectifiers. And sometimes you want to take even uh, more nonlinear uh, transformations or maybe uh, discrete decisions in the middle of the computations. And uh, I think uh, in this lab, we've been exploring a number of ideas. Uh, for example, uh, what Jorg has been doing or Chalar. Uh, and it's connected to things that, uh, where is uh, Dima? Dima is not here. Somebody should get Dima. He's, I think he's in the other lab. Dima Badanao. Um, so, um, so yeah, I don't know if uh, people have things they want to bring to that table, or I can throw some, some more um, suggestions. Any? Um, yes, Guillaume. I can start. Um, <clears throat> the idea with backprop, though, is that it seems like it's a very good way to train the models that we're using now, but but um, but. Um, uh, what I liked about the list of topics that you brought up was was the idea that backprop is not the only way to do that. There's multiple ways. Backprop just seems like the most technically correct, like uh, right. finely tuned. But uh, as much as we know that if you want to learn, you want to use Adagrad, uh, RMS prop, and all but that. These are just variants on backprop. As far as yes, they are. But they sort of tell you that the gradient isn't the most useful thing right, in the world. Right. And on top of that thing, we use mini batches. So the gradients that we're getting are already noisy. So there's already something bad happening there. And I'd say the counterpart also to that is if backprop works great for the models that we're using, maybe there are other models where, where it's not really backprop that should be used or Right. You're saying maybe we're stuck in some set of uh, models that work well for backprop and we're not exploring elsewhere. We're sort of cursed with the success of good models that can be trained with backprop. So if backprop was bad, we would be incentivized to think about a, a lot of other things, but now we're... Right, right. Actually, backprop fails on a number of, of models that people don't usually <laughs> explore. And I remember models, uh, sorry, some models, some, some types, for example, of conditional Gaussian mixtures, they're pretty hard to train with backprop. Uh, but anyways, um, I guess I was more interested in uh, thinking about, for example, comparing uh, different credit assignment mechanisms, like in reinforce, which is the, the main thing people use in, in reinforcement learning. Uh, I think we have a, another alternative to uh, credit assignment through many steps of computation. But, but I have a strong feeling that it, it doesn't scale, that it, as the number of uh, units or decisions grows, it's, it's not going to work. And that backprop ha has something fundamentally um, uh, stronger in favor for it. And it would be nice to characterize what that is. Well, one of the issues with backpropagation is that the amount of memory that it requires scales with the amount of time that you're considering. So if the human brain were using an algorithm like backpropagation for learning, it would have to store literally all of the activations that have ever been in the neurons, and that's not tractable. And I think somehow it has to be generating relevant values from the past, but we don't know what that looks like concretely. Right, right. So you're right, there's the issue of biological plausibility that is a problem with backdrop. Yeah. You don't need to save it. You could just kind of rerun your inference computation. So I'm, I'm yeah, you could save some key points. Yeah. Some, yeah. And then reconstruct there biological evidence for this where um, rats replay their memories backwards when, after they've done a maze, right? Uh, or the, the, the firing patterns replay in reverse sequence. But it, so but some, something is going on there. Uh, they are able to recreate the neural trajectories somehow. And yeah, what Bjork said seems like the most plausible. Uh, but, okay, but that wouldn't still solve the question of how brains do anything like backprop, even for uh, not, not a long sequence, right. but one, one sort of 100 millisecond uh, time slot. 
and somehow you have to be able to deal with the issue of sparsity, which is that if you're considering what could have caused a problem that you have right now with your learning in the past, you probably don't want to consider all of the learning that you've done in the past. You probably just want to consider specific events from the past. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate on what you're saying? Oh, so uh, let's say uh, I start taking a class and I make a decision about whether I'm going to study or not. And you then I get, study. and then I get to the final exam, and I get like a zero percent because I didn't study. Yeah. The decision that I need to improve upon is the decision that I made months ago. Right. So somehow I need to pick out that right, specific right. point in time. That's right. That's right. And and it gets very hard for something, anything like backprop, to do that because if you use something like backprop, we've seen in all of the modern work with. Uh, uh, memory nets and so on that you need and soft attention right? you need to give uh, a little bit of uh, credit to many possible things and if the number of such things is very large like the number of things that happened in my life in the last three months then we're in trouble it's, it must be something else that we're doing but aren't these two different things so on the one hand Backprop does local optimization, so you make a decision, or you actually you don't make a decision because yeah. everything's deterministic. Oh, are you saying be, be careful to use the word backprop not to mean gradient descent? Mm -hmm. So yeah. backprop does the gradient assignment, and then gradient descent uses yeah. it to do go down the gradient. And the thing I think that really we don't understand is backprop gradient descent. I mean, we don't we don't understand. We'd like to generalize, but the way we think about Backprop also means that everything is kind of deterministic, so you, you all yes. your activations have a specific value given, like your input. Right, right. And one thing you said just it makes sense to explore more, so to get kind of instead of only getting these right. local. So gradients, with reinforce, you have to explore. Yeah. but too much. Seemingly. But too much. Yeah. Simultaneously, yeah. Like the actions, yeah. the action space is two to the n, yeah. uh, or <coughs> in time. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like what we're missing from reinforce is, I mean, the reason get lost in the variance, it's just you have this combinatorial explosion. But we're missing reinforce some way of compartmentalizing these huge right. yeah. combinatorial yes. spaces, right? Yes, and I think that's what backprop does. I think you're putting the finger on the right point, which is, I think... But I backpropagate through my, my simplified model of what reality is. And in that sense, it's because I don't have the luxury of having the actual right, right, model, right. whereas on computers... In, in reinforcement learning, that's a very common problem, right? Yeah, they sort of model the world as they yeah. can, and then the... And then you backprop through your model. It's called, I mean, in, in the old days, uh, in the 80s, I think uh, they called that actor critic. Mm. So the critic is your proxy for mm. how the world would react to your actions. Yeah. Prediction of the reward. So maybe in, in um, Alex's example with the, do I study or not? And do I get it's a good example. zero or not? Yeah. Uh, um, um, in this case, it's because there's a simplified model above that. So it's not really like the daily actions, like do I eat breakfast today? Does that influence my decision to keep not studying and so on? It's, it's really the simplified study, yes, no, leads to this, leads to that. And then you can make it finer. But, but you backpropagate through that, that higher up that ab abstract abstraction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we wouldn't be able to backprop through three months of life by going through each second, right? So, can well, you do some so I think there's, there's, there's an instructive bit of this example, where it, which is the reason that most courses aren't structured around a 100% counting exam, is that you, you structure Except it so that... Except at McGill, where it's 70%. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's arguments to be made about that, but... Um, you, in most courses, you have some sort of intermediate feedback. Right. And I think what we're missing from reinforce is some, some principled way of deriving intermediate, intermediate yeah. rewards. And backprop target does that, prop right? is, is, yeah. is one example, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, backprop or target prop is a yeah. way to try to compute a desired feedback. And I think we should think more about ways to learn this credit assignment machinery. So all of the encoder, decoder, uh, Helmholtz machines, uh, you know, variational encoder, they have the spirit, if you look carefully, uh, that, that you learn a kind of inverse mapping or a, a reward, a, cr a credit assignment machinery, basically, that goes in the other direction. I guess it's very dangerous to go via introspection into what we think, how we act, but still, um, it seems we humans even have multiple models that we choose, that we switch between even when we make decisions. Right. So there doesn't seem to be a contradiction to just kind of have a full family of models that 
Uh, I mean, that's so how does it help us with the discussion here? I'm a bit confused. Uh, just as kind of an additional point that you don't have to use one model in the backward direction and maybe one global model that tries to model that's your actual objective that you try to Learns sort of the expected reward um, uh, given, given your actions, for example. And then, uh, so let's call that uh, r hat of a, right? Um, and so then, then you, could, you could use backprop instead. So if, if you're able to get a good model of the world where you just observe, so you observe <coughs> actions and some, some states and, and you observe rewards, right? Um, then, then if you have backprop, you can backprop through the, the, um, the, uh, the model of the world. It's not the real world, of course. You can't backprop through the real world, as, as you were saying. But, but you can backprop through that. Now, of course, the issue that we are discussing here is that what do you do if A is, uh, is discrete, right? If the actions are discrete, uh, then, then you're really in trouble because the, that whole story about backprop falls down. So this, this thing is not new. People have been doing this since the, the late 80s, but uh, it's only for actions that are continuous. Uh, and also there are some issues like if the model is not good enough, then you might actually uh, have a lot of trouble and you still need some kind of exploration. Otherwise, you, you believe, let's say, I believe that uh, it's very bad to go in my office, so I never go in my office and I never discover that actually it's a pretty nice place and <laughs> I should actually go there, spend more time there, right? Um, so, uh, so, but, but, so we can, I think the, it's pretty obvious to me that the brain learns a model of the world. In other words, a predictive model. Because there are things you cannot, you can never experience yourself. Like I've never uh, died of a car accident, and so I don't have any training examples to tell me how I should behave to avoid that directly, right? Like by by immediate experience. The only way I can learn to act correctly here is by building a a model, and the way I would get this model is not by observing pairs of A and R, is because I have. Uh, I have actually a predictive model, like an unsupervised learning model, that tells me what you know what will be the future observations uh, given given the current state. Right. So uh, this has to be mediated through through a model of the world that that tells me what's going to happen in the future uh, based on the current state and, and and my actions. So this is the model-based reinforcement learning is is needed at some point. Right. For for some some really complicated types of, uh, of learning where we can't experience some of the things. The only way we can do is deduce them. And that has to be done through a pretty abstract level of how the world works. So what I find interesting is that with the uh, VAE and like also related to XLEAP kind of things, we see that so whenever we have another model that this model likes to have entropy. So there's some pressure to explore automatically from right, the map. Right, 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 right. So I find it interesting, and that goes back to what Shala was saying. Um, so maybe yes, this so this question of adding intrinsic. noise and entropy is, yeah, it comes up almost everywhere. And I think if we, if we deal with discrete actions that like I was talking about, then maybe you have no choice, right? Because we can't play the game of infinitesimal changes. But you can say A actually comes from some distribution P of A given some state, right? So if A comes from some distribution, now uh, that means I have to sample different actions. And uh, maybe we can find a way to get some credit on the P rather than the A itself. And straight through is kind of cheat to say, oh, I have a gradient on the A. I, I do like if A was continuous. And I'm going to pass it as if it was a, a, credit, a gradient on the P, right? So it's a very cheap trick, which we're playing with. Uh, and um, it would be nice to have a better theory and, and uh, yeah. But, but in all cases, you, you do need this kind of uh, noise injection uh, and entropy, as you were saying. Yeah. And why do you even think that humans have properly solved that in things that we will need to solve before we ever get to the, the, uh, the, the, the level of sort of abstract human reasoning? Like, we're able to plan on a micro scale how to reach over and, and pick up an object. And that already uh, is hard. And that's extremely hard. So uh, worrying about how, you know. But actually, the guided policy search. How a robot will plan its career so is, that it can qualify for a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. Be the happy life as a robot. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, it, it's, no, but it's just a way to say 
let's be humble about it, sure. not think that we have solved it all and we only need to map what we do to machines and then they would be wonderful like we are. Like, let's... Yeah. And I think what you're saying is, is uh, about you know, your decisions and beliefs being self-reinforcing. And that's, I think that's your, your inference model overfitting to the data that it has almost. <laughs> Um, or at least overfitting the data that it wants, uh, or, uh, you know, and then you have circularity about co about intentions and things like that. But yeah. so random observation. Yeah. Has anyone ever done research uh, about the the shape of the area uh, in which a particular discrete decision stays constant? Uh, maybe I don't understand your question. Uh, so you mean like uh, the, 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 uh, the simplex of parameter settings under which a particular right. event is, a right, discrete right, right, event right. is constant? So what information would you I, I don't that? know the answer to your question, but, but I had a very uh, big surprise recently when I saw some visualization of the cost function um, projected in, 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 in low dimension uh, for rectifier networks, deep rectifier networks. And you'd, you would think, because rectifier networks are made of these pieces, right? So you would expect that the, the, the overall cost function would be some kind of piecewise linear thing with a lot of pieces. But it turns out that when you look at the, uh, the cost function of these neural nets, projected in low D because we can visualize it, it looks incredibly smooth, right? So, so you know, they have these 3D things. And, and of course, if you zoom in, you will see some small piecewise linear uh, elements. But so there's something funny about com composing many discrete decisions such that uh, at the end of the day, so many in parallel and in sequence, right, like in a neural net. Uh, and at the end of the day, you end up with something that looks overall very smooth with respect to changes in the parameters, right? Because this is induced, this is in the parameter space, right? This is theta and this is the cost. If it's a classifier loss, though, then the loss... Well, like a log like to you, yes. Then the loss is a smooth function of the output. So then yes, the parameters... But, no, but you would expect that changing the parameters would make switches in which neurons turn on and, I mean, are active or inactive, right? Yeah. And that would induce a kind of piecewise linear shape that could be arbitrarily complicated. Yeah. And you would think it might have many ups and downs and things like that, but it turns out it's very, very smooth. And that's kind of surprising. It, it's kind of counterintuitive. But that's over your whole training set. I mean, you average over a lot of numbers. So if you average a lot of uh, these no, kinky no, no, things, no, no, you no. wind I, up with Well, a, OK, so that I, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure w whether that was for a single example or for the whole training set. If it was for a single example, that would be troubling. If it was for the whole training set, that large, large I, numbers. So this is very related to projecting onto the small dimensional subspace. I mean, there's no reason to suspect in my mind that it isn't like maybe if you oh, could you view mean, if you're aligned with the activations or something then of course it's it's full of kinks but if, if, if you're just smooth sailing on the linear region yeah, no, you I, just, I mean like if you could visualize this thing in the actual you know million dimensional parameter space yeah. like it probably would look much more like Nonlinear to the extent that things in a million yeah, it, dimensional space it look might like be anything. A, it and might be <laughs> edges go like that, not not like yeah. not orthogonal to each other. So when yeah. what, however you right. project, you always see like so. So this effect might be uh, just due to the low dimensionality of the projection. That's mm, possible. I don't think so, and this doesn't surprise me so much in light of two pieces of evidence that okay. are already there. Yeah. Number one is the fact that you can find adversarial <coughs> examples by just taking the sign of the gradient and doing a right. small step. Right. Uh, and this this is you know this intuition was from the fact that. As a function of their input, their, their, our networks are very, very, very linear. Yeah. Uh, the other one, also due to Ian, uh, is uh, the, uh, the observation that the, bet between an, the initialization point and, and the minimum, uh, there really aren't any. Yeah, we no, don't see, at yeah. least on that straight line, yeah. any ups and downs. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's not the trajectory yep. we follow during yep. learning, but you yep. know, 